Part One, Chapter Sorting by Marianne. Joining room, as though caught napping, Prince Andrei shook himself, and his face assumed the same expression which it had worn in Anna Pavlovna's drawing room. Pierre set his feet down from the sofa. The princess came in. She had already changed her dress for another, a wrapper to be sure, but equally fresh and elegant. Prince Andrei got up and courteously pushed forward an easy chair. "'Why is it, I often wonder,' she remarked, speaking as always in French, and at the same time briskly and spryly sitting down in the easy chair. "'Why is it that Annette never married? How stupid you all are, messieurs, that you never married her. You will excuse me for saying so, but you have not the slightest comprehension of women. What an arguer you are, Monsieur Pierre!' "'Your husband and I were just this moment arguing. "'I cannot understand why he wants to go to war,' said Pierre, "'turning to the princess without any of the embarrassment "'so commonly shown in the relations of a young man toward a young woman.' "'The princess gave a start. "'Evidently Pierre's words touched her to the quick. "'Ah, that is exactly what I say,' said she. "'I do not understand. "'Really I do not understand why men cannot live without war.' Why is it that we women wish nothing and need nothing? Now you be the judge. I will tell him just as it is. Here he is adjutant to uncle, a most brilliant position. Everybody knows him. Everybody esteems him. The other day, at a Praskin's, I heard a lady asking, C'est ça la femme ou présent, mes paroles du noir. She began to laugh. And he is received so everywhere. He might very easily be even flegal adjutant. You know his majesty talks very cordially with him. Annette and I have talked it all over. It might be very easily arranged. What do you think? Pierre glanced at Prince André, and seeing that this conversation did not please his friend, made no reply to her. When are you going? he asked. Ah, don't speak of going. Don't speak of it. I do not wish to hear a word of it, exclaimed the princess, in the same capriciously vivacious tone in which she had spoken to Ippolit. It was obviously out of place in the family circle, in which Pierre was an adopted member. Today, when it came over me that I had to break off from all these pleasant relations, and then, you know, André, she blinked her eyes significantly at her husband. J'ai pour, j'ai pour, she whispered. A shiver ran down her back. Her husband looked at her with a surprised expression, as though for the first time he had noticed that anyone besides himself and Pierre had come into the room. Then with a cool politeness he addressed his wife inquiringly. "'What is it that you are afraid of, Lisa? I cannot understand,' said he. "'Now how selfish all you men are! All! All selfish! Simply from his own whim, God knows why!' He deserts me, shuts me up in the country alone. With my father and sister, don't forget that, said Prince André, gently. All alone, just the same, away from my friends, and he expects me not to be afraid. Her tone grew querulous, her lip was lifted, making the expression of her face not mirthful but repulsive and like a squirrel's. She paused, as though she regarded it as indecorous to speak of her condition before Pierre, though it was the real secret of her fear. "'And still I do not understand why vous avez Pierre,' drawled Prince André, letting his eyes rest on his wife. The princess blushed, and spread open her hands with a gesture of despair. "'Non, André, j'ai des coups vous avez tellement, tellement changé. "'Your doctor bids you to go to bed earlier,' said Prince André. "'You had better retire.' The princess made no answer, and suddenly her short, downy lip trembled. Prince André, shrugging his shoulders, got up and began to walk up and down the room. Pierre gazed through his glasses with naive curiosity, first at him, then at the princess, and made a motion as though he also would get up, but then changed his mind. "'What difference does it make to me if Monsieur Pierre is here?' suddenly exclaimed the little princess, and her pretty face at the same time was contracted into a tearful grimace. 
I have been wanting for a long time to ask you, André, why you have changed toward me so. What have I done to you? You are going to the army. You are not sorry for me at all. Why is it? These, exclaimed Prince André, but this one word carried an entreaty, a threat, and above all a conviction that she herself would regret what she had said. But she went on hurriedly. You treat me as though I were ill, or a child. I see it all. You were not so six months ago. These, I beg of you to stop, said Prince André, still more earnestly. Pierre, growing more and more stirred as this conversation proceeded, arose and went to the princess. He could not, it seemed, endure the sight of tears, and he himself was ready to weep. Calm yourself, princess. This is only your fancy, because, I assure you, I myself have experienced, and so, because. No, excuse me, a stranger is in the way. No, calm yourself. Good-bye. Prince Andrei detained him, taking him by the arm. No, stay, Pierre. The princess is so kind that she will not have the heart to deprive me of the pleasure of spending the evening with you. Yes, he only thinks about his own pleasure, exclaimed the princess, not restraining her angry tears. Lise, said Prince Andrei, dryly, raising his voice sufficiently to show that his patience was exhausted. Suddenly, the angry, squirrel-like expression on the princess's pretty little face changed to one of alarm, both fascinating and provocative of sympathy. Her beautiful eyes looked from under her long lashes at her husband, and there came into her face that timid look of subjection, such as a dog has, when it wags its drooping tail quickly but doubtfully. "'Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu!' muttered the princess, and gathering up the skirt of her dress with one hand, she went to her husband and kissed him on the forehead. "'Bonsoir, Lise,' said Prince André, getting up and courteously kissing her hand as though she were a stranger. The friends were silent. Neither the one nor the other felt like being the first to speak. Pierre looked at Prince André. Prince André rubbed his forehead with his slender hand. "'Let us have some supper.' said he, with a sigh, getting up and going to the door. They went into the elegant dining-room, newly furnished in the richest style. Everything, from the napkins to the silver, the faience and the glassware, had that peculiar imprint of newness which is characteristic of the establishment of a young couple. In the midst of supper, Prince André leaned forward on his elbows, and— like a man who has for a long time had something on his heart and suddenly determines to confess it, he began to talk with an expression of nervous exasperation such as Pierre had never before beheld in his friend. Never, never get married, my friend. This is my advice to you. Do not marry until you have come to the conclusion that you have done all that is in your power to do and until you have ceased to love the woman whom you have chosen until you have seen clearly what she is. Otherwise you will make a sad and irreparable mistake. When you are old and good for nothing, then get married. Otherwise, all that is good and noble in you will be thrown away. All will be wasted in trifles. Yes. 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 Don't look at me in such amazement. If ever you have any hope of anything ahead of you, you will be made to feel at every step that, as far as you are concerned, all is at an end, all closed to you, except the drawing-room, where you will rank with the court lackeys and idiots. That's a fact. He made an energetic wave of his hand. Pierre took off his spectacles, and this made his face, as he gazed in amazement at his friend, even more expressive than usual of his goodness of heart. My wife, continued Prince André, is a lovely woman. She is one of those few women to whom one can feel that his honor is safely entrusted. But my God, what I would not give at this moment if I were not married. You are the first and only person to whom I have whispered this, and it is because I love you. Prince André, in saying this, was still less like the Bolkonsky who, that same evening, had been comfortably ensconced in Anna Pavlovna's easy-chairs 
and murmuring French phrases as he blinked his eyes. Every muscle in his spare face was quivering with nervous animation. His eyes, in which before the fire of life seemed to be extinguished, now gleamed with a fierce and intense brilliancy. It was evident that, however lacking in life he might appear in ordinary circumstances, he more than made up for it by his energy at moments of almost morbid excitability. "'You cannot understand why I say this to you,' he went on. "'Why, it is the whole history of a life. "'You talk about Bonaparte and his career,' said he, "'although Pierre had not said a word about Bonaparte. "'You talk about Bonaparte, but Bonaparte, when he was toiling, "'went step by step straight for his goal. "'He was free. "'He let nothing stand between him and his goal, and he reached it. "'But tie yourself to a woman.' and your whole freedom is destroyed, as though you were a prisoner in chains, and in proportion as you feel that you have ambition and powers, the more you will be weighed down and tormented with regrets. Drawing-rooms, tittle-tattle, balls, vulgar show, meanness, such is the charmed circle from which it is impossible for me to make my escape. I am now getting ready to take part in the war, in the greatest war that ever was, and yet I know nothing, and am fit for nothing. Je suis très aimable et très cause de coup, continued Prince André, and at Anna Pavlovna they hang upon my lips, and this stupid society, without which my wife cannot live, and these women. If you could only know what toutes les femmes destinguées and women in general amount to, my father is right. Egotism, ostentation, stupidity, meanness in every respect. Such are women when they show themselves in their real light. You see them in society and think that they amount to something, but they are not. 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 No. Don't marry, my dear heart. Don't marry, said Prince André in conclusion. It seems ridiculous to me, said Pierre, that you should regard yourself as incapable and your life is spoiled. Everything is before you. Everything. And you. He did not finish his sentence, but his very tone made it evident how highly he prized his friend and how much he expected from him in the future. How can he speak so, thought Pierre, who considered Prince André the model of all accomplishments, for the very reason that Prince André united in himself to the highest degree all those qualities that were lacking in Pierre, and which more nearly than aught else can express the concept, will-power. Pierre always admired Prince André's ability to meet with perfect ease all sorts of people. His extraordinary memory, his breadth of knowledge. He had read everything, he knew about everything, he had ideas on every subject. And, above all, his powers of work and study— and if Pierre was often struck by André's lack of aptitude for speculative philosophy, which was his own specialty, he at least regarded it not as a fault, but as a sign of strength. In all the best relations, however friendly and simple, flattery or praise is indispensable, just as grease is indispensable for making wheels move easily. Je suis un homme fini, said Prince André. What is there to say about me? "'Let us talk about yourself,' said he, after a short silence, and smiling at his consoling thoughts. This smile was instantly reflected on Pierre's face. "'But what is there to say about me?' asked Pierre, his lips parting in a careless, merry smile. "'What am I, anyway?' "'Je suis un bâtard.' And suddenly a purple flush dyed his cheeks. It was evident that he had exerted great effort to say that. Sans non, sans fortuna, and yet it is true. He did not say what was true. I am free for the present, and I like it. Only I don't know what to take up next. I should like to have a serious talk with you on the subject. Prince André looked at him with kindly eyes, but in his glance, friendly and flattering as it was, there was betrayed the consciousness of his superiority. I am fond of you especially for the reason that you are the only living man in all our circle. You are happy. Choose whatever you like. It is all the same. You will be happy anywhere. 
but there's one thing. Stop going to those Kurrigans and leading their kind of life. That sort of thing does not become you. All those revels, that wild life and all. Que voulez-vous, mon cher? exclaimed Pierre, shrugging his shoulders. Les femmes, mon cher, les femmes. I don't understand it, replied André. Les femmes comme il faut, that is another thing, but such as have to do with Kurrigan. Les femmes et le va. I can't understand it. Pierre had been living at Prince Vasily Kurrigan's and had been taking part in the dissipated life of his son Anatole, the very same young man to whom it had been proposed to marry Prince André's sister in order to reform him. Do you know, said Pierre, as though a happy thought had come unexpectedly into his mind, seriously, I have been thinking about it for some time. Since I have been leading this sort of life, I have not been able to think or to come to any decision. My head aches. I have no money. This evening he invited me, but I did not go. Give me your word of honor that you will not go with him again. Here's my word on it. End of chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 It was already two o'clock when Pierre left his friend. It was a luminous June night, characteristic of Petersburg. Pierre took his seat in the hired carriage, with the intention of going home, but the farther he rode, the more impossible he found it to think of sleeping on such a night, which was more like twilight or early morning. He could see far down through the empty streets. On the way it occurred to him that the gambling club were to meet as usual that evening, at Anatoly Kurrigan's, after which they were accustomed to have a drinking bout, topping off with one of Pierre's favorite entertainments. It would be good fun to go to Kurrigan's, said he to himself, but instantly he remembered that he had given Prince André his word of honor not to go there again. But, as it happens to men of no strength of character, this was immediately followed by such a violent desire to have one more last taste of this dissipated life, so well known to him, that he determined to go. And, in excuse for it, the thought entered his mind that his promise was not binding, because, before he had given it to Prince André, he had also promised Anatole to be present at his house. Moreover, he reasoned that all such pledges were merely conditional and had no definite meaning, especially if it were taken into consideration that perhaps by the next day he might be dead, or something might happen to him so extraordinary that the distinctions of honorable and dishonorable would entirely vanish. Arguments of this nature often occurred to Pierre, entirely upsetting his plans and purposes he went to Kurrigan's. Driving up to the great house at the horse guard barracks, where Anatole lived, he sprang upon the lighted porch, ran up the steps, and entered the open door. There was no one in the entry. Empty bottles, cloaks, and overshoes were scattered about. There was an odor of wine. In some distant room he could hear loud talking and shouts. Play and supper were over, but the guests had not yet dispersed. Pierre threw off his cloak and went into the first room. Where were the remains of the supper? A single waiter, thinking that no one could see him, was stealthily drinking up the wine in the half-empty glasses. In a third room were heard the sounds of scuffling, laughter, the shouts of well-known voices, and the growl of a bear. Eight young men were eagerly crowding around an open window. Three were training with the cub, which one of their number was dragging by a chain, and trying to frighten the others with. "'I bet a hundred on Stevens,' cried one. "'See that he doesn't hold on,' cried a second. "'I bet on Dolokhov,' cried a third. "'Get those fellows away from the bear, Kurrigan. "'There, let Mishka go. The wager is here. "'One pull, or he loses,' cried a fourth. "'Yakov, bring the bottle. "'Yakov,' cried the host of the evening, "'a tall, handsome fellow,' standing in the midst of the crowd, in a single thin shirt, thrown open at the chest. Hold on, gentlemen, here he is, here is our dear friend, Petrushka, he cried, turning to Pierre. A short man, with clear blue eyes, whose voice, among all those drunken voices, was noticeable for its tone of sobriety, shouted from the window, Come here, and hear about the wagers. This was Dolokhov, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, a well-known gambler and bully, 
whose home was with Anatole. Pierre smiled, as he gaily looked around him. I don't understand at all. What's up? Hold on. He's not drunk. Bring a bottle, cried Anatole, and taking a glass from the table, went up to Pierre. First of all, drink. Pierre proceeded to drain glass after glass, at the same time closely observing and listening to his drunken companions, who had again crowded around the window. Anatole kept his glass filled with wine, and told him how Dolokhov had laid a wager with Stevens, an English navalman who happened to be there, that he, Dolokhov, was to drink a bottle of rum, sitting in the third-story window, with his legs hanging out. "'There, now, drink it all,' said Anatole, handing the last glass to Pierre. "'I shan't let you off.' "'No, I don't wish any more,' replied Pierre, and pushing Anatole aside, he went to the window." Dolokhov was holding the Englishman by the arm, and was clearly and explicitly laying down the conditions of the wager, turning more particularly to Anatole and Pierre as they approached. Dolokhov was a man of medium height, with curly hair and bright blue eyes. He was twenty-five years old. Like all infantry officers, he wore no moustache, so that his mouth, which was the most striking feature of his face, was wholly revealed. The lines of the mouth were drawn with remarkable delicacy. The upper lip closed firmly over the strong lower one in a sharp curve at the center, and in the corners hovered constantly something in the nature of two smiles, one in each corner, and all taken together, and especially in conjunction with a straightforward, bold, intelligent look, made it impossible not to take notice of his face. Dolokhov was not a rich man and he had no influential connections. But although Anatole spent ten thousand roubles a year, and it was known that Dolokhov lived with him, nevertheless he had succeeded in winning such a position that Anatole and all who were acquainted with the two men had a higher regard for him than for Anatole. Dolokhov played nearly every kind of a game, and almost always won. However much he drank, he never was known to lose his head. Both Kurigan and Dolokhov were at this time notorious among the rakes and spendthrifts of Petersburg. The bottle of rum was brought. Two lackeys, evidently made timid and nervous by the orders and shouts of the boon companions, tried to pull away the sash that hindered anyone from sitting on the outer slope of the window-seat. Anatole, with his swaggering way, came up to the window. He wanted to smash something. He pushed the lackeys away and tugged at the sash, but the sash would not yield, so he broke the window panes. "'Now you try it, you man of muscle,' said he, turning to Pierre. Pierre seized hold of the crossbar, gave a pull, and the oaken framework gave way with a crash. "'Take it all out, or they'll think I clung to it,' said Dolokhov. "'The Englishman accepts it, does he? All right?' asked Anatole. "'All right,' said Pierre, glancing at Dolokhov, who took the bottle of rum and went to the window, through which could be seen the sky where the evening and morning light were beginning to mingle. He leaped upon the window-sill with the bottle in his hand. Listen, he cried, as he stood there, and looked back into the room. All were silent. I wager, he spoke French so that the Englishman might understand him, and spoke it none too well, either. I wager fifty imperials, or perhaps you prefer a hundred? he added, addressing the Englishman. No, fifty, replied the Englishman. Very well, then, fifty it is, that I will drink this whole bottle of rum without taking it once from my mouth, drink it sitting in this window, in that place there, he bent over and pointed to the sloping projection of the wall outside the window, and not holding on to anything. Is that understood? Very good. Anatole turned to the Englishman, and holding him by the button of his coat and looking down upon him, for the Englishman was of small stature, began to repeat the terms of the wager in English. Hold, cried Dolokhov, thumping the window with the bottle in order to attract attention. Hold, Kurigan, listen. If anyone else does the same thing, then I will pay down a hundred imperials. Do you understand? The Englishman nodded his head, though he did not make it apparent whether or no he were prepared to accept this new wager. Anatole still held him by the button, and, in spite of the nods that he made to signify that he understood all that was said, 
Anatol insisted on translating Dolokhov's words for him into English. A lean young Lipusar, who had been playing a loser game all the evening, climbed upon the window, leaned over, and gazed down. Who? Who? Ho! Oh, he exclaimed as he looked down from the window to the flagstones below. Hush! cried Dolokhov, and he pulled the officer back from the window, who, getting his feet entangled in his spurs, awkwardly leaped down into the room. Placing the bottle on the window sill so as to be within reach, Dolokhov warily and coolly climbed into the window. Letting down his legs and spreading out both hands, he measured the width of the window, sat down, let go his hands, moved to the right, then to the left, and took up the bottle. Anatole brought two candles and set them on the window seat, although it was now quite light. Dolokhov's back, in the white shirt, and his curly head were illuminated on both sides. All gathered around the window. The Englishman stood in the front row. Pierre smiled and said nothing. One of the older men present suddenly stepped forward, with a stern and frightened face, and attempted to seize Dolokhov by the shirt. "'Gentlemen, this is folly. He will kill himself,' said this man, who was less foolhardy than the rest. Anatole restrained him. "'Don't touch him. You will startle him, and then he might fall. What if he should, eh?' Dolokhov turned around, straightening himself up, and again stretching out his hands. "'If anyone touches me again,' said he, hissing the words through his thin, compressed lips, "'I shall send him flying down there. So now.' Thus having spoken, he resumed his former position, dropped his hands, and seizing the bottle, he lifted it to his lips, bent his head back, and raised his free arm as a balance. One of the lackeys, who had begun to clear away the broken glass, paused in his work, and, without straightening himself up, fixed his eyes on the window and Dolokhov's back. Anatol stood straight with staring eyes. The Englishman, thrusting out his lips, looked askance. The man who had tried to stop the proceeding repaired to one corner of the room and threw himself on a sofa, with his face to the wall. Pierre covered his eyes, and the feeble smile still hovering over his lips now expressed horror and apprehension. All were silent. Pierre took his hand from his eyes. Dolokhov was still sitting in the same position, only his head was thrown farther back, so that the curly hair in the nape of his neck touched his shirt-collar, and his hand, holding the bottle, was lifted higher and higher, trembling under the effort. The bottle was evidently nearly empty, and consequently had to be held almost perpendicularly over his head. Why should it take so long? thought Pierre. It seemed to him as though more than a half hour had elapsed. Suddenly Dolokhov's body made a backward motion, and his arm trembled nervously. This tremor was sufficient to make him slip as he sat on the sloping ledge. In fact, he slipped, and his arm and head wavered more violently as he struggled to regain his balance. He stretched out one hand to clutch the window seat, but refrained from touching it. Pierre again covered his eyes, and declared to himself that he would not open them again. Suddenly he was conscious that there was a commotion around him. He looked up. Dolokhov was standing on the window seat. His face was pale, but radiant. Empty. He flung the bottle at the Englishman, who cleverly caught it on the fly. Dolokhov sprang down from the window. He exhaled a powerful odor of rum. Capital! Bravo! That's a wager worth having. The devil take you all, were the voices that rang from all sides. The Englishman, taking out his purse, was counting out his money. Dolokhov was scowling and had nothing to say. Pierre started for the window. "'Gentlemen, who wants to make the bet with me? I will do the same thing,' he cried. "'But there's no need of any wager. Give us a bottle. I will do it anyway. Bring a bottle.' "'Hold on, hold on,' said Dolokhov, smiling. "'What's the matter with you? Are you beside yourself? We won't let you. It makes you dizzy even on a staircase.' were shouted from various sides. "'I will drink it. Give me a bottle of rum,' cried Pierre, pounding on the table with drunken resolution, and climbing into the window. He was seized by the arm, but his strength was so great that whoever approached him was sent flying across the room. "'No, you will never dissuade him that way,' said Anatole. "'Hold on. 
I will throw dust in his eyes. Listen, I will make the wager with you, but tomorrow, but now we are all going to blanks. Come on, cried Pierre. Come on, and we will take Mishka with us. And seizing the bear, he began to gallop round the room with him. End of chapter 7 Part 1, Chapter 8 of Prince Vasily fulfilled the promise which he had made to the Princess Drubetskaya when she asked him on the evening of Anna Pavlovna's reception to help her only son, Boris. The request had been preferred to the emperor, and contrary to the experience of many others, he was allowed to enter the Semyonovsky regiment of the guard as ensign. But in spite of all Anna Mikhailovna's efforts and intrigues, Boris failed of his employment as adjutant or attaché to Kutuzov. Shortly after Anna Pavlovna's reception, the princess returned to Moscow and went straight to her rich relations, the Rostovs, at whose house she always stayed when visiting in Moscow, and where her idolized Borenka had been educated from early childhood and had lived some years, waiting to be transferred from the line to his position as ensign of the guard. The guard had already left Petersburg on the 22nd of August, and the young man, delayed in Moscow by his uniform and outfit, was to join his regiment at Radzivilov. The Rostovs were celebrating the fete day of the mother and the youngest daughter, both of whom were named Natalia. Since morning there had been an unceasing stream of carriages coming and going with guests, who brought their congratulations to the countess's great mansion on the Povarskaya, so well known to all Moscow. The countess herself and her eldest daughter, a beautiful girl, were in the drawing-room receiving the guests, whose places were constantly filled by newcomers. The Countess Rostova was a woman of forty-five, of a thin oriental type of countenance, and evidently worn out by her cares as mother of a family of a dozen children. Her deliberateness of motion and speech, which arose from her lack of strength, gave her a certain appearance of dignity that commanded respect. The Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya, in her capacity of friend of the family, was also in the drawing-room, helping to receive the company and join in the conversation. The young people were in the rear rooms, not considering it incumbent upon them to take part in receiving the visitors. The Count met the guests and escorted them to the door again, urging them all to dine with him. "'Very, very much obliged to you, ma chère, or mon cher. Ma chère and mon cher, he said to all without exception, without the slightest shadow of difference whether his guest stood high or low in the social scale. Much obliged to you for myself and for my dear ones, whose name day we are celebrating. See here, I come back to dinner. You'll affront me if you do not, mon cher. Cordially I invite you, and my whole family join with me, mon cher. These words he repeated to all, without exception or variation, with an unchanging expression on his round, jolly, and clean-shaven countenance, and with a monotonously firm grip of the hand, and with repeated short bows. Having escorted a guest to his carriage, the Count would return to this, that, or the other visitor, still remaining in the drawing-room, dropping down on a chair with the aspect of a man who understands and enjoys the secret of life, he would cross his legs in boyish fashion, lay his hands on his knees, and shaking his head significantly, would send forth his conjectures concerning the weather, or exchange confidences about health, sometimes speaking in Russian, sometimes in very exorable but self-confident French, and then again with the air of a weary man, who is nevertheless bound to fulfill all obligations, he would go to the door with still another departing guest, straightening the thin grey hairs on his bald head, and dutifully proffering the invitations to dinner." Sometimes returning through the entry to the drawing-room, he would pass through the conservatory and butler's room to the great marble hall, where covers were laid for eighty guests, and glancing at the butlers who were bringing the silver and china, setting the tables and unfolding the damask table linen, he would call to him Dmitri Vesalievich, a man of noble family, who had charge of all his affairs, and would say, "'Well, well, Mitenka, see that everything is all right. That's good. That's good,' he would say, glancing with satisfaction on the huge extension table. The principal thing is the service. Very good, very good. And with a deep sigh of satisfaction, he would go back to the drawing-room once more. 
Marya Lvovna Karagin and her daughter, announced the countess's footman in a thundering bass voice, coming to the door. The countess was thoughtful for a moment and took a pinch of snuff from a gold snuff box ornamented with a portrait of her husband. I am tired to death of these callers, said she. Well, this is the last one I shall receive. She is very affected. Ask her to come in, she said to the footman, in a mournful voice, as though her words had been, If I must be killed, kill me now. A tall, portly, haughty-looking lady, in a rustling train, came into the drawing-room, followed by her round-faced, smiling young daughter. Dear Countess, it has been such a long time. She has been ill in bed, le pauvre enfant. Ou belle de raison mosqui, et la comtesse à proxine. J'ai et si oreza. Such were the phrases spoken by lively feminine voices, and mingling with the rustle of silks and the moving of chairs. That sort of conversation had begun which is, by unanimous consent, maneuvered in such a way that at the first pause the visitor is ready to get up with the rustling garments to murmur, Je sais bien charmé. La santé de maman. À la comtesse à Praxine. And again, with rustling garments, to be to retreat into the entry, to throw on the shuba or the cloak, and to depart. The conversation was turning on the chief item of city news at that time, namely, the illness of the famous old Count Bozokoy, one of the richest and handsomest men of Catherine's time, and also about his illegitimate son, Pierre, the same young man who had behaved in such an unseemly manner at Anna Pavlovna's reception. "'I am very sorry for the old Count,' said one of the ladies. "'His health is so wretched, and now to have to suffer this mortification on account of his son, it will be the death of him.' "'What is that?' asked the Countess, as though she were not aware of what the visitor was talking about, although she had heard fifty times already the cause of Count Bezakoy's mortification. "'It all comes from the present system of education. Sending them abroad,' pursued the lady. "'This young man has been left to shift for himself, and now they say that he has been carrying on so horribly in Petersburg that the police had to interfere and send him out of the city.' "'Pray tell us about it,' urged the Countess. "'He made a bad choice of friends,' remarked the Princess Anna Mikhailovna. Prince Vasily's son, this Pierre, and a young man named Dolokhov, they say, have been doing, heaven only knows what, but all of them have had to suffer for it. Dolokhov has been reduced to the ranks, and Bezukhoi's son has been sent to Moscow, and Anatol Kuragin has been taken in charge by his father. At all events, he has been sent away from Petersburg. Yes, but what is it, pray, that they did? asked the Countess. They acted like perfect cutthroats, especially Dolokhov, said the visitor. He is a son of Maria Ivanovna Dolokhova, such an excellent woman. Just think of it. Can you imagine it? The three of them somehow got hold of a bear, took it with them into a carriage, and carried it to the house of some actresses. The police hastened to apprehend them. They seized the officer and tied him back to back to the bear, and then threw the bear into the Moskva. The bear started to swim, with the police officer on his back. "'Capital, mon cher! What a figure this officer must have cut!' cried the Count, bursting with laughter. "'Oh, how terrible! What can you find to laugh at, Count?' But the ladies had to laugh in spite of themselves. "'It was with difficulty that they rescued the unfortunate man,' pursued the visitor. "'And to think that a son of Count Kirill Vladimirovich Bezakoy should find amusement in such intellectual pursuits,' she added sarcastically. "'But they say that he is so well-educated and so clever. That shows what educating young men abroad makes of them. I hope that no one will bring him here, though he is so rich. They wanted to give him an introduction to me. I most decidedly refused. I have daughters, you know.' "'What made you say that this young man was so rich?' asked the Countess, bending away from the younger ladies, who immediately pretended not to hear what she was saying. "'You see, he has only illegitimate children, it appears, and Pierre is also illegitimate.' The guest waved her hand. "'I imagine he has a score of them.' The Princess Anna Mikhailovna took part in the conversation, with the evident desire of showing off her powerful connections and her acquaintance with all the details of high life.' 
"'This is the truth of the matter,' said she, significantly, and also in a half-whisper. "'Count Kirill Vladimirovitch's reputation is notorious. As for his children, he has lost count of them, but this Pierre was his favourite. "'How handsome the old man,' said the countess, "'and only last year, too. I never saw a handsomer man.' now he is very much changed said anna mikhailovna as i was going to say on his wife's side prince vasily is the direct heir to all his property but the old man is very fond of pierre has taken great pains with his education and has written to the emperor about him so that no one knows if he should die he is so weak that it may happen any moment and dr lorraine has come up from petersburg no one knows i say which will get his colossal fortune pierre or prince vasily he has forty thousand souls and millions i know all about this because prince vasily himself told me yes and besides kirill vladimirovitch is my great-uncle on my mother's side and he is also boris's godfather she added pretending that she attributed no significance to this circumstance prince vasily came to moscow yesterday he is on some official business i was told said the guest yes but entre nous said the princess it's a mere pretext he has come principally on account of count kirill vladimirovitch because he knew that he was so sick at all events mon cher that's a splendid joke said the count and perceiving that the elderly visitor did not hear him he turned his attention to the young ladies charming figure that cut by the police officer i can imagine it and as he waved his arms in imitation of the unfortunate police officer he again burst into a ringing bass laugh, which made his portly frame fairly shake, as is the way with men who always live well, and especially those who indulge in generous wines. So glad to have you dine with us, said he. End of chapter 8 Part 1, Chapter 9 of A Silence Ensued the countess looked at the guest smiling pleasantly but nevertheless making no pretence of the fact that she would not be sorry if she got up and took her departure the daughter was already arranging her dress and looking inquiringly at her mother when suddenly there was heard in the next room the noise of several persons running towards the door then the catching and upsetting of a chair and instantly into the drawing-room darted a maiden of thirteen holding something in her short muslin skirt she halted in the middle of the room and it was evident that her wild frolic had carried her farther than she had intended at the same instant there appeared in the door a student with a crimson collar a young officer of the guard a maiden of fifteen and a plump rosy-faced little boy in a frock the count jumped up and swinging his arms threw them around the little girl who had come running in ah here she is he cried with a jolly laugh her name day mon cher her name day mon cher il y a un ton pour tout said the countess feigning severity you are always spoiling her Ily, she added addressing her husband bonjour mon cher je vois felicite said the visitor coulez de ses enfants she added turning to the mother the little maiden with her black eyes and her large mouth was not pretty but was full of life her childish shoulders still breathlessly rising and sinking from the effort of her exciting running were bare her dark locks were thrown back in confusion she had thin bare arms and wore pantalettes trimmed with lace and low slippers on her dainty feet she was at that charming age when the girl is no longer a child but when the child is not yet a young lady tearing herself away from her father she ran to her mother and giving no heed to her stern reproof hid her blushing face in the lace folds of her mother's mantilla and went into a fit of laughter the cause of her laughter was the doll which she took out from under her skirt trying to tell some fragmentary story about it do you see it's my doll <laughs> mimi you see and Natasha was unable to say any more. It seemed to her so ludicrous. She leaned on her mother and laughed so merrily and infectiously that all, even the conceited visitor, in spite of herself, joined in her amusement. Now, run away, 
run away with your monster admonished the mother pushing away her daughter with pretended sternness she is my youngest she added turning to the visitor natasha for a moment raising her face from her mother's lace mantle glanced up at the stranger through her tears of laughter and again hid her face the visitor compelled to admire this family scene felt it incumbent upon her to take some part in it tell me my dear said she turning to natasha what relation is this mimi to you she is your daughter i suppose natasha was offended by the condescending tone in which the lady addressed her she made no reply and looked solemnly at her meantime all the young people mentioned the officer who was none other than boris the son of princess anna mikhailovna nikolai the student the count's oldest son sonya the count's fifteen-year-old niece and the little Petrusha, his youngest boy all crowded into the drawing-room evidently doing their utmost to restrain within the bounds of propriety the excitement and merriment which convulsed their faces it could be seen that there in the rear rooms from which they had rushed so impetuously they had been engaged in much more entertaining conversation than town gossip the weather and comtesse apraxine occasionally they would glance at one another and find it hard to refrain from bursting out laughing again the two young men the student and the officer who had been friends from childhood were of the same age and were both good-looking but totally unlike each other boris was tall and fair with regular delicate features and a placid expression nikolai was a short curly-haired young man with a frank open countenance on his upper lip the first dark down had already begun to appear and his whole face was expressive of impetuosity and enthusiasm nikolai's face had flushed crimson the moment he entered the drawing-room it was plain to see that he strove in vain to find something to say boris on the contrary immediately regained his self-possession and began to relate calmly and humorously how he had been acquainted with this mimi kolka when she was a fine young lady before her nose had lost its beauty how since their acquaintance begun five years before she had grown aged and cracked as to the whole surface of her cranium as he said this he looked at natasha but she turned away from him and looked at her little brother who was squeezing his eyes together and shaking with suppressed laughter and finding that the effort was beyond her power snickered out loud and darted from the room as fast as her nimble little feet would carry her boris managed to preserve his composure maman do you not want to go out shall i not order the carriage he asked turning to his mother with a smile yes yes go and order it please said she returning his smile boris quietly left the room and went in pursuit of natasha the plump little boy trotted sturdily after them as though he was vexed at heart at the disarrangement made in his plans end of chapter nine part one chapter ten of the young people not reckoning miss Karajina and the cousin's oldest daughter who was four years older than her sister and regarded herself as already grown up only nikolai and the niece sonya remained in the drawing-room sonya was a miniature little brunette with a tawny tinted complexion especially noticeable on her neck and bare arms which were slender but graceful and muscular she had soft eyes shaded by long lashes and she wore her black hair in a long braid twined twice about her head by the easy grace of her movements by the suppleness and softness of her slender limbs and by a certain cunning and coyness of manner she reminded one of a beautiful kitten which promises soon to grow into a lovely cat she evidently considered it the right thing to manifest her interest in the general conversation by a smile but her eyes against her will shot glances of such passionate girlish adoration from under their long thick lashes at her cousin who was soon to join the army that her smile could not for an instant deceive any one and it was plain to see that the kitten had only crouched down in order to jump and play all the more merrily with her cousin as soon as the two followed the example of boris and natasha and left the drawing-room yes ma chere said the old count turning to mrs kuragina and pointing to nikolai 
his friend Boris here, has been appointed an officer of the guard, and they are such good friends that they cannot be separated, so he throws up the university and his old father, and is going into the military service, mon cher. And yet there was a place all ready for him in the department of the archives, and all. That's what friendship is, concluded the Count, with a dubious shake of the head. Yes, there's going to be a war, they say, said the visitor. They have been saying so for a long time, replied the Count, and they will say so again, and keep saying so, and that will be the end of it. Mon cher, that's what friendship is, he repeated. He is going to join the hussars. The visitor, not knowing what reply to make, shook her head. It is not out of friendship at all, declared Nikolai, flushing up, and spurning the accusation as though it were a shameful aspersion on his character. It is not from friendship at all, but simply because I feel drawn to a military life. He glanced at his cousin and at the young lady visitor. Both were looking at him with a smile of approbation. Colonel Schubert, of the Pavlogradsky Regiment of Hussars, is going to dine with us tonight. He has been home on leave of absence and was going to take Nikolai back with him. "'What's to be done about it?' asked the Count, shrugging his shoulders and affecting to treat as a jest what had evidently occasioned him much pain. "'I have already told you, Papenka,' said the lad, "'that if you do not wish me to go, I will stay at home. But I know that I am not good for anything except the army. I cannot be a diplomatist or a chinovic. I can't hide what I feel.' And as he said this, he glanced, with a handsome young fellow's coquetry, at Sonya and the young lady visitor. The kitten feasted her eyes on him, and seemed ready at a second's notice to play and show all her kittenish nature. "'Well, well, let it go,' said the old Count. "'He's all on fire. This Bonaparte has turned all their heads. They all think what an example he gave them in rising from a lieutenant to be an emperor. Well, good luck to them,' he added, not noticing his visitor's sarcastic smile. They began to talk about Napoleon. Julie Karagina turned to young Rostov. How sorry I was that you didn't come last Thursday to the Arkharovs. It was lonesome there without you, said she, giving him an affectionate smile. The young man, much flattered, drew his seat nearer to her and engaged the smiling Julie in a confidential conversation, entirely oblivious that this coquettish smile cut as with a knife the jealous heart of poor Sonya, who flushed and tried to force a smile. In the midst of this conversation he happened to glance at her. She gave him a look of passionate anger, and, scarcely able to hold back her tears, and with the pretended smile still on her lips, got up and left the room. All Nikolai's animation deserted him. He availed himself of the first break in the conversation, and with a disturbed countenance left the room in search of Sonya. "'How the secrets of these young folks are sewed with white threads!' exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna, nodding in the direction of the vanishing Nikolai. "'Cousinage dangereux visionage,' she added. "'Yes,' replied the countess, when, as it were, the very light of the sun had departed from the room, together with these young people, and then, as though she were answering a question which no one had asked, but which was constantly in her mind. How much suffering, how much unrest, must be gone through with in order that at last we may have some joy in them. And even now, truly, there's more sorrow than joy. You're always in apprehension, always in apprehension. This is the age when there are so many perils for both young girls and for boys. It all depends upon the education, said the visitor. Yes, you are right, continued the countess. So far I have been, thank God, the confidant of my children, and enjoy their perfect confidence, declared the countess, repeating the air of many parents who cherish the illusion that their children have no secrets in which they do not share. I know that I shall always be my daughter's chief confidant, and that Nicolina, even with his impetuous nature, if he does play some pranks, as all boys will, still, there's no danger of his being like those Petersburg young men. Yes, they're splendid, splendid children, emphatically affirmed the Count, 
who always settled every question too complicated for him by finding everything splendid. But what's to be done? He wanted to go into the hussars. What would you have, mon cher? What a charming creature your youngest girl is, said the visitor. Like powder. Yes, like powder, said the Count. She resembles me, and what a voice she has. Although she is my daughter, yet I am not afraid to say that she is going to be a singer, a second Salomini. We have engaged an Italian master to teach her. Isn't she too young yet? They say it is injurious for the voice to study at her age. Oh, no. Why do you consider it too early? exclaimed the Count. Didn't our mothers get married when they were twelve or thirteen? And she's already in love with Boris. Just think of it, said the Countess, looking at the Princess with a sweet smile. Then, apparently answering a thought that constantly occupied her, she went on to say, Well, now, you see, if I were too strict with her, if I were to forbid her, God knows what they might be doing on the sly. She meant they might exchange kisses. But now I know everything they say. She comes to me herself every evening and tells me all about it. Maybe I spoil her, but indeed this seems to be the best plan. I kept a too strict reign over my eldest daughter. Yes, I was brought up in an entirely different way, said the oldest daughter, the handsome Countess Viera, smiling. But the smile did not add to the beauty of her face, as often happens. On the contrary, it lost its natural expression and therefore became unpleasant. She was handsome, intelligent, well-bred, well-educated. Her voice was pleasant. What she said was right and proper enough, and yet, strange to say, her mother and all the others looked at her as though surprised at her saying such a thing, and regarded it as one of the things that had better have been left unsaid. People always try to be very wise with their eldest children, Try to accomplish something extraordinary, said the visitor. How naughty to prevacate, mon cher. The little countess tried to be very wise with Viera, said the count. Well, on the whole, she has succeeded splendidly, he added, winking approvingly at his daughter. The visitors got up and took their departure, promising to return to dinner. What manners! I thought they were going to stay for ever remarked the countess, after she had seen her visitors to the door. End of chapter 10 Part 1, Chapter 11 When Natasha left the drawing-room, she ran only as far as the conservatory. There she paused, listening to the chatter in the drawing-room, and expecting Boris to follow her. She was already beginning to grow impatient, and stamped her foot, on the very verge of crying because he did not follow her instantly, when she heard the noisy, deliberate steps of a young man. Natasha hastily sprang between some tubs of flowers and concealed herself. It was Boris, who paused in the center of the room, looked around him, brushed the dust from the sleeve of his uniform, and then, going to the mirror, contemplated his handsome face. Natasha, holding her breath, peered out from her hiding place and waited to see what he would do. He stood for some moments in front of the mirror, then, smiling with satisfaction, went toward the entrance door. Natasha was just about to call to him, but then she thought better of it. "'Let him find me,' she said to herself. As soon as Boris had left the conservatory, Sonya came in from the other door, all flushed and angrily muttering to herself. Natasha restrained her first impulse to run to her, and kept in her hiding-place, as though under an invisible cap, looking at what was going on in the world." she was experiencing a new and peculiar enjoyment. Sonya was still muttering something, and looking expectantly towards the drawing-room. Then Nikolai made his appearance. "'Sonya, what is the matter? How can you do so?' asked the lad, going up to her. "'No, no, leave me alone!' and Sonya began to sob. "'Well, I know what the trouble is. "'If you know, so much the better. Go back to her, then.' Sonia, one word! How can you torment me and torment yourself for a mere fancy? asked Nikolai, taking her hand. Sonia did not withdraw her hand and ceased weeping. Natasha, not moving and hardly breathing, peered from her concealment. What will they do now, I wonder? she said to herself. 
Sonya, the whole world is nothing to me. Thou alone art all to me, said Nikolai, and I will prove it to thee. I don't like it when you talk so with... Well, I won't do so any more. Only forgive me, Sonya. He drew her to him and kissed her. Ah, how nice, thought Natasha, and when Sonya and Nikolai had left the room, she followed them and called Boris to her. Boris, come here, said she, with her face full of mischievous meaning. I want to tell you something. Here, come here, she said, and drew him into the conservatory, to the very place among the tubs where she had been hiding. Boris, smiling, followed her. What may this something be? he inquired. She grew confused, glanced around her, and espying the doll which she had thrown on one of the tubs, she took it up. "'Kiss the doll,' said she. Boris looked down into her eager face, with an inquiring, gracious look, and made no reply. "'Don't you care to? Well, then come here,' said she, and made her way deeper among the flowers, at the same time throwing away the doll. "'Nearer, nearer,' she whispered. She seized the officer's coat by the cuff, and her flushed face expressed eagerness and apprehension. "'Then will you kiss me?' she whispered, so low as hardly to be heard, looking up at him and smiling, and almost crying with emotion. Boris reddened. "'How absurd you are!' he exclaimed, but he bent over to her, reddening still more violently, but not quite able to make up his mind whether to do it or not. Natasha suddenly sprang on a tub, so that she was taller than he, threw both slender bare arms around his neck, and by a motion of her head, tossing back her curls, kissed him full on the lips. Then she slipped away between the flower-pots, and hanging her head, stood still on the other side. "'Natasha,' said he, "'you know that I love you, but—' "'Are you in love with me?' asked Natasha, interrupting him. "'Yes, I am.' but please let us not do this again. In four years, then I will ask for your hand. Natasha pondered. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, said she, reckoning on her delicate fingers. Good, then it is decided, and a smile of joy and satisfaction lighted up her animated face. Yes, it is decided, said Boris. Forever and ever, said the girl, till death itself, and taking his arm, she went with a happy face into the divan room with him. End of chapter 11 Part 1, Chapter 12 of The Countess was now so tired of receiving that she gave orders not to admit any more visitors, and the Swiss was told to invite anyone else who came to return to dinner. The Countess was anxious to have a confidential talk with the friend of her childhood, the Princess Anna Mikhailovna, whom she had scarcely seen since her return from Petersburg. Anna Mikhailovna, with her rather sad but pleasant face, drew her chair nearer to the countess. "'I will be perfectly frank with you,' said she. "'We have very few of our old friends left, and that's why I prize your friendship so highly.' She glanced at Viera and paused. The countess pressed her hand. Then, turning to her eldest daughter, who was evidently not her favorite, she said, Vera, haven't you any perception at all? Cannot you see that you are in the way? Go to your sisters, or— The handsome Vera smiled scornfully, evidently not feeling the least offended. If you had only told me sooner, Mamenka, I should have gone immediately, said she, and she left the room. But as she was going past the divan room, she saw that two couples were snugly ensconced in the embrasures of the two windows— she paused and smiled satirically. Sonya was sitting close by Nikolai, who was copying some verses in her honor, the first he had ever written. Boris and Natasha were sitting in the other window, and stopped talking as Viera passed. Both of the girls looked up at her with guilty, yet happy faces. It was both amusing and touching to see these two girls, so head over ears in love, but the sight of them evidently did not rouse pleasant thoughts in Viera's mind. "'How many times have I asked you not to touch my things?' said she. "'You have your own room.' And she took the inkstand away from her brother. "'Wait a minute, wait a minute,' said he, 
dipping his pen. "'You always succeed in doing things at just the wrong time,' exclaimed Viera. "'There you come running into the drawing-room, so that every one was mortified on your account. "'In spite of the fact, or perhaps because what she said was perfectly true, "'no one made her any reply, and all four only exchanged glances among themselves. "'Viera lingered in the room, holding the inkstand in her hand. "'And how can such young things as Natasha and Boris, and you two, have secrets? "'It's all nonsense.' "'Well, what concern is it of yours, Viera? asked Natasha, in a gentle voice, defending herself. She was evidently more than ordinarily sweet, and well disposed to everyone just at the time. It's very stupid, said Viera. I blush for you. What sort of secrets? Everyone has his own. We don't disturb you and Berg, said Natasha, hotly. I suppose you don't disturb me, said Viera and because you can't find anything improper in my behavior. But I'm going to tell Mamenka how you behave to Boris. Natalia Ilyanishna behaves very well to me, said Boris. I cannot complain of it. Stop, Boris. You are such a diplomat. The word diplomat was in great vogue among the young people, with a special meaning which they gave to it. It's very annoying, said Natasha, in an offended and trembling voice. "'Why should she worry me so? "'He will never understand such things,' she added, turning to Viera. "'Because you never were in love with anyone. "'You have no heart. "'You are only Madame de Genise.' "'This was a nickname considered very insulting, "'which had been first applied to Viera by Nikolai. "'And your chief pleasure is to cause other people annoyance. "'You may flirt with Berg as much as you please,' she said, spitefully. "'Well, at all events,' You don't find me running after a young man in the presence of visitors. There, now, you have done what you wanted, interrupted Nikolai. You have said all sorts of unpleasant things and disturbed us all. Let's go to the nursery. All four, like a frightened bevy of birds, jumped up and flew out of the room. It's you who have been saying unpleasant things, but I haven't said anything to anyone, cried Viera. Madame de Genlis, Madame de Genlis, shouted the merry voices from the other room, through the open door. The handsome Viera, who found a sort of pleasure in doing these unpleasant and irritating things, smiled, evidently undisturbed by what was said of her, went to the mirror and rearranged her sash and hair. As she caught a glimpse of her pretty face, she became to all appearances cooler and more self-satisfied. Meantime, the ladies in the drawing-room continued their talk. Ah, cher, said the countess, in my life, tu ne parose. I cannot help seeing that at the rate we are going, our property will not hold out much longer. And then his club and his easy ways. Even if we live in the country, how much rest do we get? Theatricals, hunting, and heaven knows what all. But what's the use of my talking? Now tell me how you manage to get along. I often marvel at you, Annette. How is it that you, at your time of life, fly about so in your carriage, alone, in Moscow, in Petersburg, to all the ministers, to all the notables, and succeed in getting around them all? I marvel at it. Now tell me, how do you do it? I cannot understand it at all. Ah, my dear heart, replied the Princess Anna Mikhailovna. May God forbid that you ever learn by experience what it is to be left a widow, and without any protector, with a son whom you adore. You get schooled to everything, she went on to say, with some pride. My lawsuit has given me a great experience. If I need to see any bigwig, I write a note. Princess Untel desires to see such and such a person, and I myself go in a hired carriage, twice, three times, four times, until I get what I need. It is a matter of indifference to me what they think of me. Well, now, how was it? Whom did you apply to for Borenka? asked the countess. There he is already an officer of the guard, and my Nikolushka is going merely as a yunker. There was no one to work for him. Whom did you ask? Prince Vasily. He was very kind. He immediately consented to do all in his power, 
and he laid the matter before the emperor said the princess anna mikhailovna entirely forgetting in her enthusiasm all the humiliation through which she had passed for the attainment of her ends prince vasili must have aged somewhat queried the countess i have not seen him since our theatricals at the rumyatsovs i suppose he has entirely forgotten me il m'a fusé la cour she added with a smile he is just the same as ever replied anna mikhailovna polite and full of compliments his head hasn't been turned at all by his elevation i am grieved that it is such a small thing to do for you my dear princess said he you have only to command me no he's a splendid man and a lovely relative to have but you know nathalie my love for my boy i don't know what i would not do for his happiness but my means are so small for doing anything continued the princess in a melancholy tone lowering her voice they are so small that i am really in a most terrible position my unlucky lawsuit eats up all that i have and is no nearer to an end i have nothing you can imagine it a la lette i haven't a kopeck and i don't know how i shall get boris his uniform she drew out her handkerchief and began to weep i must have five hundred roubles and all i have is a twenty-five rouble bill that's the position i am in i have only one hope now in kirill vladimirovitch buzakoy if he will not help out his godson for you see he stood sponsor to boris and grant him something for his support that all my pains will have been lost i shall not have enough to pay for his uniform the countess shed some sympathetic tears and sat silently pondering maybe it's a sin said the princess but i often think there is count kira buzakoy living alone that enormous fortune and why does he live on life is a burden for him while boris is only beginning to live he will probably leave something to boris said the countess god only knows cher ami these rich men and grandees are so selfish but nevertheless i am going right away to see him with boris and i am going to tell him plainly how things are let them think what they please of me it is all the same to me when my son's fate depends upon it the princess got up it is now two o'clock and you dine at four i shall have plenty of time to go there and with the decision of the true petersburg lady of business who knows how to make the best use of her time she called her son and went with him to the entry good-bye dear heart she said to the countess who accompanied her to the door wish me luck she added in a whisper so that her son might not hear so you are going to count kirill vladimirovitch ma chere said the count coming out from the dining-room into the entry if he is better ask pierre to come and dine with me you see he used to be here a great deal and danced with the children now we shall see how splendidly taras will do by us to-day he declares that count orloff never had such a dinner as we are going to have End of chapter twelve part one chapter thirteen mon cher boris said the princess anna mikhailovna to her son as the countess rostova's carriage in which they were riding rolled along the straw-covered street and entered the wide court of count kirill vladimirovitch buzakoy's residence mon cher boris said the mother stretching out her hand from under her old mantle and laying it on her son's with a timid and affectionate gesture be amiable and considerate count kirill vladimirovitch is your godfather and your prospects depend upon him remember this mon cher be as nice as you can be if i knew that anything would come from this except humiliation replied the son coldly but i have given you my promise and i do it for your sake though it was a respectable carriage that drove up to the steps the swiss noticing the lady's well-worn mantle looked askance at mother and son who without sending the footman to announce them had walked straight into the mere lined vestibule between two rows of statues standing in niches and asked them who they wished to see the young princesses or the count and when they said the count 
he told them that his excellency was worse and could not receive any one to-day then let us go said the son in french mon ami exclaimed the mother in a supplicating voice again laying her hand on his arm as though her touch had the effect of calming or encouraging him boris said no more but without removing his cloak looked dubiously at the mother my dear said the princess in a wheedling tone turning to the swiss i know that count kirill vladimirovitch is very ill that is why i came i am a relative of his i do not wish to disturb him my dear i only wanted to know see prince vasily sergeyevitch i understand that he is here be so good as to announce us the swiss gruffly pulled the bell cord and turned away princess dubetskaya for prince vasily sergeyevitch he called to the footman in small clothes pumps and dress coat who ran to the head of the stairs and looked over from above the princess straightened the folds of her dyed silk dress glanced at the massive venetian mirror on the wall and firmly mounted the carpeted staircase in her old worn shoes mon cher vous me va promis said she turning round to her son and encouraging him with a touch of her hand the young man dropping his eyes silently followed her they went into a hall which led into the suite of rooms occupied by prince vasily just as the mother and son started to walk through this room and were about to ask the way of an elderly footman who had sprung to his feet on their approach the bronze door-knob of one of the heavy doors turned and prince vasily himself dressed in a velvet fur-trimmed coat with a single star as though he were at home came in escorting a handsome black-bearded man this man was the celebrated petersburg doctor lorraine c'est donc positif the prince was saying mon prince errare humanum est mais replied the doctor who swallowed his r's and spoke the latin words to air is human with a strong french accent c'est bien c'est bien perceiving anna mikhailovna and her son prince vasily dismissed the doctor with a bow and advanced in silence and with an inquiring look toward them the son noticed that his mother's eyes suddenly took on an expression of deep concern and grief and he laughed in his sleeve under what melancholy circumstances we meet again prince well how is our dear invalid said she as though she did not notice the cold insulting glance fastened upon her prince vasily looked questioningly at her and then at boris as though he were surprised to see them there boris bowed civilly prince vasily entirely ignoring it replied to anna mikhailovna's question by a significant motion of his head and lips giving her to understand that there was very slim hope for the sick man is it possible cried anna mikhailovna ah oh, this is terrible fearful to think this is my son she added pointing to boris he was anxious to thank you in person boris again bowed politely be assured prince that a mother's heart will never forget what you have done for us i am glad if i have been able to be of service to you my dear anna mikhailovna said prince vasily adjusting his frill and manifesting both in tone and manner here in moscow before anna mikhailovna whom he had put under deep obligation a far more consequential air than at petersburg at annette scherer's reception do your best to serve with credit and prove yourself deserving he added turning to boris i am glad are you here on leave of absence he asked in an apathetic tone i am waiting for orders your excellency before setting out for my new position replied boris manifesting not the slightest resentment of the prince peremptory tone nor any inclination to pursue the conversation but bearing himself with such dignity and deference that the prince gave him a scrutinizing glance do you live with your mother i live at the countess rostova's said boris again taking pains to add your excellency it is that ilya rostov who married nathalie shashina said anna mikhailovna i know i know returned prince vasily in his monotonous voice i could never understand how nathalia made up her mind to marry that unlicked bear a perfectly stupid and absurd creature and a gambler besides they say 
mais très brave somme mon prince remarked anna mikhailovna smiling with a touching smile as though she too knew very well that count rostof deserved such an opinion of him but did her best to say a good word for the poor old man what do the doctors say asked the princess after a short silence and again allowing an expression of deep grief to settle upon her careworn face very little hope said the prince i wanted so much to thank my uncle once more for all his kindnesses to me and boris he's his godson she added in french in such a tone as though this piece of information must be highly delightful to the prince prince vasily sat pondering and knitting his brows anna mikhailovna realized that he was apprehensive lest she were a rival for the count's inheritance she hastened to reassure him if it were not for my true love and devotion to my uncle said she uttering the words my uncle with remarkable effrontery and unconcern i know his noble straightforward character but you see he has only the young princesses with him they are both so inexperienced she inclined her head and added in a whisper has he yet fulfilled the last duty prince how precious are these last moments things couldn't be worse he should be prepared at once if he is so ill we women prince she smiled with self-importance always understand how to put these things it's indispensable that i should see him however hard it may be for me but then i am accustomed to sorrow the prince evidently knew only too well just as he had known at annette Scherer's, that he would have no little difficulty in getting rid of anna mikhailovna this interview might be injurious to him cher anna mikhailovna better wait till evening the doctors have been expecting a crisis but it is impossible to wait prince at such moments pensez il y avait du salut de son homme ah c'est terrible les devoirs d'un chrétien a door opened and from an inner chamber appeared one of the count's nieces a young lady with a sour cold face and with a waist disproportionately long for her stature prince vasily went toward her well how is he just about the same but what could you expect this noise said the princess staring at anna mikhailovna as though she were a stranger ah cher i did not recognize you exclaimed anna mikhailovna with a beaming smile and ambling lightly forward toward the count's niece i have just come and i am at your service to help you take care of my uncle i can imagine how much you have suffered she added still in french and sympathetically turning up her eyes the count's niece made no reply nor did she even smile but immediately left the room anna mikhailovna took off her gloves and established herself in an armchair as though ready to endure a siege and motioned to the prince to sit down near her boris she said to her son with a smile i am going to see the count my uncle in the meantime mon ami you go and find pierre and don't forget to give him the invitation from the rostovs they asked him to dinner i think very likely he may not wish to come she suggested turning to the prince on the contrary returned the prince evidently very much annoyed i should be very glad to have him taken off my hands he stays in his own room the count has not asked for him once he shrugged his shoulders a footman conducted the young man downstairs and then up by another flight to pierre's quarters End of chapter 13Pierre had not succeeded in choosing a career for himself when he was sent to Moscow on account of his disorderly conduct. The story which had been related at Count Rostov's was correct. Pierre had been one of the young men who had tied the policeman on the bear's back. He had arrived in Moscow a few days previous and taken up his abode as usual in his father's house. Although he foresaw that the story would be noised abroad in Moscow, and that the ladies who formed his father's household and who were always hostile to him would take advantage of this occurrence to irritate the count against him he nevertheless on the very day of his arrival started to go to his father's apartments as he went into the drawing-room where the princesses usually sat he stopped to pay his respects to the ladies 
who were there busy with their embroidery frame and in listening to a book which one of them was reading aloud. There were three of them. The oldest, a severely prim old maid with a long waist, the very one who had made the descent upon Anna Mikhailovna, was the reader. The younger ones, both rosy-cheeked and rather pretty, and exactly alike, except that one of them had a little mole on her lip, decidedly adding to her beauty, were engaged at the embroidery frame. Pierre was received like a ghost, or a leper. The oldest princess ceased reading, and silently looked at him with eyes expressive of alarm. The one without the mole did the same. The third, who had the mole and some sense of the ludicrous, bent over the embroidery to conceal a smile, caused by what she thought promised to be an amusing scene. She drew the thread down and bent over, as though studying the pattern, but in reality to hide her laugh. "'Bonjour, mon cousine,' said Pierre. "'Vous ne me reconnaissez pas?' I know you very well, altogether too well. How is the Count? Can I see him? asked Pierre, awkwardly as usual, but still not disconcerted. The Count is suffering, both physically and mentally, and it seems you have taken pains to cause him the greater part of his moral suffering. Can I see the Count? repeated Pierre. Hm. If you desire to kill him, to kill him out and out, then you can see him. Olga, go and see if the bullion is ready for uncle. It is high time, she added, making Pierre see by this that they were wholly absorbed in caring for his father, while he, on the contrary, was palpably bent on annoying him. Olga left the room. Pierre stood still, looking at the sisters, and then said with a bow, Then I will go back to my room. As soon as it is possible, you will please tell me. He went out, and behind his back was heard the young princess's laugh, ringing but not loud. On the next day came Prince Vasily, and put up at the Count's. He called Pierre, and said to him, Mon cher, si vous vous condescez, ici comme à Petersburg, vous finirez très mal, c'est tout ce que vous dites. The Count is very ill, very ill. It is imperative that you should not see him. From that time Pierre had been left severely alone, and spent his days in solitude, upstairs in his own rooms. At the moment that Boris appeared at the door, Pierre was walking up and down his room, occasionally pausing in the corners and making threatening gestures at the walls, as though trying to thrust through some unknown enemy, and looking savagely over his spectacles, and then again beginning his promenade, muttering indistinct words, shrugging his shoulders and spreading out his hands. L'angleterre terre avec vécu, he was declaiming, with a frown and pointing at some imaginary person with his finger. Monsieur Pitt, comme traître à la nation et à droit des gens, et comme damnia. But he had no time to complete his denunciation of Pitt, spoken by himself, personating his hero Napoleon, in whose company he imagined himself crossing the perilous Dover Straits, and already taking London by storm, before he caught sight of a handsome, well-built young officer coming towards him. He stopped short. Boris was a lad of fourteen when he had last seen him, and he did not recognize him at all. But, nevertheless, he seized him by the hand in his impulsive, cordial way, and smiled affectionately. "'Do you remember me?' asked Boris, calmly, with a pleasant smile. "'I came with my mother to see the Count.' but it seems he is too ill to receive us. Yes, he is very ill. They keep him stirred up all the time, returned Pierre, striving to recollect who this young man was. Boris was certain that Pierre did not recognize him, but he did not think it necessary to tell him his name, and without manifesting the slightest awkwardness, he looked him full in the face. Count Rostov invites you to dine with him this afternoon, said he after a rather long silence that made Pierre feel uncomfortable. "'Ah, Count Rostov!' exclaimed Pierre, joyfully. "'Then you are his son, Ilya. At the first instant I did not recognize you, as you can easily imagine. Do you remember how you and I and Madame Jacotte used to go out walking on the Sparrow Hills, years ago?' "'You are mistaken,' said Boris deliberately, 
and with a bold and rather derisive smile. I am Boris, the son of the Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya. Rostov's father is named Ilya, and his name is Nikolai, and I never knew Madame Jocot. Pierre made a gesture with his hands and head, as though he were driving away mosquitoes. Ah, it is so indeed. I have mixed everything all up. I have so many relatives in Moscow. So you are Boris? Yes. Well, you and I seem to have begun with a misunderstanding. Well, what do you think of the expedition to Bologna? It will go pretty hard with the English, if only Napoleon crosses the Channel, won't it? I think the expedition is feasible, if only Villeneuve doesn't fail him. Boris knew nothing about the Bologna expedition. He had not read the newspapers, and this was the first time he had ever heard of Villeneuve. We here in Moscow are more taken up with dinners and gossip than with politics, said he, in his calm, satirical tone. I know nothing about such things. Moscow is given over especially to tittle-tattle, he went on to say. Now you and the Count are the talk. Pierre smiled his good-natured smile, as though to depreciate anything unpleasant which his companion might be likely to say. But Boris spoke with due circumspection, clearly and dryly, looking straight into Pierre's eyes. "'Moscow likes to do nothing better than talk gossip,' he repeated. "'All are solicitous about knowing to whom the Count is going to leave his property, and yet, very possibly, he will outlive all of us. I hope so with all my heart.' "'Yes, this is all very trying,' interrupted Pierre. "'Very trying.' Pierre all the time was apprehensive lest this young officer should unexpectedly turn the conversation into some awkward channel. "'But it must seem to you,' said Boris, flushing slightly, but not allowing his voice or his manner to vary. "'It must seem to you that all take an interest in this simply because they hope to get something from the estate.' "'Here it comes,' thought Pierre. "'I expressly wish to tell you, lest any misunderstanding should arise,' that you are entirely mistaken if you consider me and my mother in the number of these people. We are very poor, but I at least say this on my own account for the very reason that your father is rich, that I do not consider myself a relative of his, and neither I nor my mother would ask or even be willing to receive anything from him. Pierre for some time failed to comprehend, but when the idea dawned on him, he leaped from the sofa seized Boris under the arm with characteristic impetuosity and clumsiness, and while he reddened even more than the other, he began to speak with a mixed feeling of vexation and shame. Now, this is strange. I, then, indeed, and who would have ever thought? I know very well. But Boris again interrupted him. I am glad that I have told you all. Perhaps it was disagreeable to you. You will pardon me, said he soothing Pierre, instead of letting himself be soothed by him. I hope that I have not offended you. It is a principle with me to speak right to the point. What answer am I to give? Will you come to dinner to the Rostovs? And Boris, having acquitted himself of a difficult explanation, and got himself out of an awkward position by putting another into it, again became perfectly agreeable. Now, look here, listen said Pierre, calming down. You are a remarkable man. What you have just said is very good. Very good. Of course you don't know me. We have not met for a long time. We were still children. You might have had all sorts of ideas about me. I understand you. Understand you perfectly. I should not have done such a thing. I should not have had the courage. But it is excellent." I am very glad to have made your acquaintance. Strange, he added, after a short silence and smiling. Strange that you should have had such an idea of me, he laughed. Well, who knows? We shall get better acquainted, I beg of you. He pressed Boris's hand. Do you know, I have not seen the Count yet. He has not asked for me. It is trying to me as a man, but what can I do about it? And do you think that Napoleon will succeed in getting his army across? asked Boris with a smile. 
Pierre understood that Boris wanted to change the conversation, and taking his cue, he began to expound the advantages and disadvantages of the Bologna expedition. A footman came to summon Boris to his mother. The princess was ready to start. Pierre, looking affectionately through his spectacles, promised to come and dine with the Rostovs, so as to get better acquainted with Boris, whose hand he pressed warmly as they parted. After he was left alone, Pierre still paced for a long time up and down the room, no longer threatening an invisible enemy with the sword, but smiling at the thought of this likable young man who was so intelligent and clever and decided. As often happens in early youth, and especially when a man is lonesome, he felt an inexplicable affection for the lad, and promised himself that they should become good friends. Prince Vasily escorted the princess to the door. The good lady held her handkerchief to her eyes, and there were traces of tears on her cheeks. "'This is terrible, terrible!' she exclaimed. "'But, so far as in me lay, I fulfilled my duty. I will come back and spend the night. It is impossible to leave him in such a state. Every moment is precious. I cannot understand why the princesses have delayed about it. Perhaps God will enable me to find some means of preparing him. Adieu, mon prince.' Que les bon Dieu vous soutiennent. Adieu, ma bonne, replied Prince Vasily, as he turned away from her. Ah, he is in a frightful state, said the princess to Boris, after they had again taken their seats in the carriage. He scarcely knows anyone. I cannot understand, Mamenka, what his feelings are in regard to Pierre. Can you? asked the son. Everything will be made clear by his will, my dear. Our fate also depends upon that. What makes you think he is going to leave anything to us? Ah, my dear, he is so rich, and we are so poor. Well, that is a most inconclusive reason, Mamenka. Ah, my God, my God, how ill he is, exclaimed the mother. End of chapter 14 Part One, Chapter Fifteen. After Anna Mikhailovna and her son had gone to Count Bezukhoi's, the Countess Rostova sat for some time alone, applying her handkerchief to her eyes. At last, she rang the bell. What is the matter with you, my dear? She demanded severely of the maid, who had kept her waiting several minutes. Don't you care to serve me? If not, I can find another place for you. The countess was greatly affected by her old friend's grief and humiliation, and therefore she was out of sorts, as could be told by her speaking to the maid by the formal we, you, and milia, dear. Beg pardon, said the girl. Ask the count to come to me. The count came waddling to his wife with a rather guilty look, as usual. Well, little countess, what a sauté a Madeira of woodcock we are going to have, ma chère. I have been trying it. Tara's is well worth the thousand roubles that I give for him. It was well spent. He took a seat near his wife, with an affectation of bravery, leaning one hand on his knee, and with the other rumpling up his grey hair. What do you wish, little countess? See there, my love, how did you get that spot on you? she said, pointing to his waistcoat. It is evidently some of your sauté she added with a smile. See here, Count, I need some money. His face grew mournful. Ah, little Countess! And the Count made a great ado in getting out his pocket-book. I want a good deal, Count. I want five hundred roubles. And she took her cambric handkerchief and began to rub her husband's waistcoat. You shall have it at once. Hey there! cried the Count, in a tone used only by men who are certain that those whom they command will rush headlong at their call. Send Matenka to me. Matenka, the nobleman's son whom the Count had brought up, and had now put in charge of all his affairs, came with soft, noiseless steps into the room. See here, my dear, said the Count, to the deferential young man as he entered the door. Bring me— he hesitated. Yes, bring me seven hundred roubles. Yes, and see here, don't bring such torn and filthy ones as you do sometimes, but clean ones. They're for the countess. Yes, Matenka, 
"'Please see that they are clean,' said the Countess, with a sigh. "'Your Excellency, when do you wish them?' asked Matenka. "'You will deign to know that... "'However, don't allow yourself to be uneasy,' he added. "'Perceiving that the Count was already beginning to breathe heavily and rapidly, "'which was always a sign of a burst of rage. "'I had forgotten. "'Will you please to have them this instant?' "'Yes, yes, instantly. "'Bring them. "'Give them to the Countess.' "'What a treasure Matinka is,' he added with a smile, as the young man left the room. "'He never finds anything impossible. "'That is a thing I cannot endure. "'All things are possible.' "'Ah, money, Count, money. "'How much sorrow it causes in the world!' exclaimed the Countess. "'But this money is very important for me.' "'Little Countess, you are a terrible spendthrift,' declared the Count, and kissing his wife's hand, he disappeared again into his own apartment. When Anna Mikhailovna returned from her visit to Buzikoy, the money, all in new clean banknotes, was laying on a stand under a handkerchief in the countess's room. Anna Mikhailovna noticed that the countess was excited over something. "'Well, my dear?' asked the countess. "'Oh, he's in such a terrible state. You would never know him. He is so ill, so ill.' I stayed only a short minute, and didn't say two words. "'Annette, for heaven's sake, don't refuse me,' suddenly exclaimed the Countess, taking out the money from under the handkerchief, while her old, thin, grave face flushed in a way that was strange to see. Anna Mikhailovna instantly understood what she meant, and was already bending over so as to embrace the Countess gracefully at the right moment. "'It is from me to Boris, for his outfit,' Anna Mikhailovna interrupted her by throwing her arms around her and bursting into tears. The countess wept with her. They wept because they were friends, and because they were kind-hearted, and because, having been friends from childhood, they were now occupied with such a sordid matter as money, and because their youth had passed. But theirs were pleasant tears. End of chapter 15